Welcome to the message. This morning, uh, we'll start out, first of all, by taking our confession of faith. The reason why we take a confession of faith is that we might stir up the Holy Spirit so that as we go into the Word of God, uh, we'll have the assistance of the Holy Spirit upon our mind to cause the Word to be an enriching session. So we'll take our confession right now. One, two, go. As I sit to listen to the word of God today, a door of utterance has been opened unto us. And I hear the voice of God clearly speaking to me. This is the way to go, walk ye in it. I listen under the influence of the spirit of God. And I am not distracted by anything or anyone. The word of God is full to my spirit. I am strengthened by it this morning. It is wine to my heart, creating joy within me. It is oil to my face, causing my life to shine and giving me victory in everything that I do. As my eyes make contact with the scriptures used in this message, the Spirit of God opens new things to me. He also brings to my remembrance things Jesus once showed me. I come to understand God sees them on the earth, and I receive instruction, encouragement, correction and the enablement to live out God's will. Amen. All right, this morning I want to teach on a particular subject here and I've, I've termed this feeding on the table of the Lord. Um, you know, in Psalm 23, it tells us that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And one of the things it says he will do as a shepherd is that he will make us to lie down in green pastures and he will lead us beside the still waters. But if we skip those verses down, we also find that though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil for thou art with me. And then it tells us the Lord has prepared, uh, prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So I want to talk about this table of the Lord that he has prepared for us in the presence of our enemies. And that this table, as the scriptures tells us, we'll see, is full of fatness. And first of all, that there is a table, there's stuff on that table, and we have got to come to recognize how to feed out of this particular table of the Lord. Now let's look at an example here. If we look at um, Matthew chapter 15 from verse 22. Matthew chapter 15 from verse 22. Uh, we'll see this was the Syrophoenician woman. All right. And she was a woman of Canaan. And what this means is that she wasn't an Israelite. Therefore, technically, she wasn't past, part of the lost sheep of Israel that Jesus came in his earthly ministry to minister unto. But you know, at the beginning of the earthly ministry of Jesus, he had sent a signal to the Jews. And he was telling them that the operations of the Spirit, even historically there, seemed to have worked better on the Gentiles that's the anointing of God because with them, they didn't have that entitled mentality and commonize or ca make it a casual thing. In other words, he said, you'll tell me physician, heal yourself. He said, but were there not many widows in, in Israel when God, Elijah, was sent to the widow at Zarephath? In other words, God bypassed all the widows in Israel and it was only to the widow at Zarephath outside, all right, of them he was sent unto. That is a reason why. Uh, and then he also told them that were there not many lepers, how come it was to Naaman that Elisha was sent? And he was trying to show them how the anointing of God works upon the earth. And so we get here and we see this woman who was from Canaan. The scripture we put up 
in Matthew there and chapter 15. And it tells us in verse 22 that there was a woman. Now we're talking about the table of the Lord. All right. A woman of Canaan who came out of the same coasts. And she cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord. Have mercy on me, O Lord. She said, O Lord, thou son of David, for my daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. So the woman from Canaan said her daughter was grievously vexed with a devil. And she called on Jesus by a covenant name that was used and known by the Jews. And Jesus responds in verse 23. We'll see this. The next verse says, but he answered her not a word. Now, the reason why he did not answer her one word was because he was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel at that particular point in his earthly ministry. He was ministering under the Abrahamic covenant and he was ministering to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he didn't respond to her. Uh, this is a name and this is a virtue that when you call on Jesus, have mercy and by the name son of David, you get a response. So the scripture says, let's go there. She didn't, he didn't answer her a word. It's verse 23. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. So we can see that she had almost become a nuisance. And she kept crying after them, Son of David, have mercy. Son of David, have mercy. And Jesus did not respond to her. And then in verse 24, it tells us, and then he answered and said, and you can see why, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So we're talking about a woman whose daughter was grievously vexed with the devil. And here Jesus says there's a legal restriction on this anointing working for you. And he said, I'm only sent unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and it can only work where I'm sent. And then the woman responded. Now go back there and let's see the response there. The next thing that was said. Then she came and worshipped him, verse 25, and worshipped him saying, Lord, help me. So she left. At this point, the covenant name that is given or that can be used only by the lost sheep or by the Jewish people, the Israelites. She understood that. That Jesus was saying, you can't call me by that name. All right? Blind Bartimaeus may do that. But he is, quote there, part of, all right, the lineage of, of Abraham according to the flesh. You are not a descendant of Abraham according to the flesh. So you cannot call me by that name. And so the woman shifted ground. She pivoted right in the realm of the spirit. And it was like, Lord, my creator, I come and I worship you. Now I'm looking at you as the creator of all beings on the earth. I'm coming to worship you now as my Lord. That is, I'm not coming here. And look at the next thing that Jesus now says. The Lord worshiped him. Jesus now goes on and answered and said, it is not meat, which means, listen, it is not proper. Remember, we are talking about sitting at the table of the Lord in the presence of my enemies. It is not meat for me to take. It is not meat. He has prepared a table in the presence of my enemies and my cup runs over. What's that table? It is not meat for me to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs in other words what you are asking for is part it can be considered as the bread that is on the table that the children of abraham feed upon and you are not a descendant of abraham 
you are considered, all right, as a dog, which means in terms of the arrangement of this covenant here, you are an outsider onto this. You cannot sit at the table and partake with the children of Abraham. Now, if we look at it in Luke chapter 13, the Lord answered and said unto them, Thou hypocrite, doth not each of you on the Sabbath lose his own ox, all right, lose his ox and his ass from the stall and lead them to the way of watering? Now, hear what he said in 16 when he healed the woman. He said, Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bowed, Lo, these 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. He said, being a daughter of Abraham, she had been bound for 18 years by Satan. Jesus said, all right, part of the bread of this table is that she be released from this bondage of 18 years. Now I'm saying to you, that when we sit at that table to feed, we are talking about feeding on the manifestation, eating things that will bring about the manifestation or will externalize, cause the power of God to be demonstrated in our lives. Bondages will be broken. Uh, sickness will be here. All types of powerful things will occur once you start eating on the bread from that particular table. He said, this woman, a daughter of Abraham, ought to be loosed. The Syrophoenician widow came and said to Jesus, listen, come and kill my child. He said, you are asking for the bread that belongs to the children who sit at the table and feed on it. And the woman said, I understand the arrangement. I respect it, and I've come here as a dog. Now, let's go back to that particular scripture there. It says, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. So what she was saying is, you are my master, and that the crumbs that fall from the master's table, even the dogs eat of it. And then Jesus responded and said to a woman, Great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou hast willed. And her daughter was healed and made whole from that very hour. So crumbs from the table healed her daughter. Crumbs from the table got her daughter healed of the ailment. Crumbs out of the table. How much more will the power of God not flow within our lives if we sit at that table and start feeding, all right, on the bread from that particular table, eating the full meal? If crumbs could have fallen. Now, under this new covenant, the Bible tells us in Galatians 3 that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse, all right, for us, it says, for it is written, cost is everyone that hangeth on the tree. Why? That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles, that we might, through Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit by faith. In other words, now through the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, his sacrifice, we have now been brought from the place of being dogs, we are now seated at that particular table of the Lord. So now consciously feed from the bread of that particular table. And I want to explain how we do this. We feed from the bread of that table. Now, how many things will start happening in our lives if we start eating consciously and intentionally from the table of the Lord? That's what David was saying, that he has made me to lie down in green pastures. He was saying he has led me and prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Because I eat out of this table, 
He said, my head is anointed with fresh oil and my cup runs over. So what does it mean to sit at this table and to eat? We've seen that crumbs from the table will bring dramatic healings. We've seen that the daughter of Abraham that was bound 18 years in one moment, a, a, a bread from that table, bread came there and she, and, and she partook of the bread from that table as a daughter of Abraham and she was completely released from the bondage. So how then do we get in practice now? Now we can say that everybody knows Psalm 23, but the workings of that Psalm, okay? If I tell you go and eat at your dining table, you know exactly how to do that. You know where to sit and you easily feed on that. If, if the body of Christ could have a practical understanding of the table of the Lord, that it becomes so clear and precise in their mind as they understand the physical table that they go to. How will great wonders not begin to happen within their lives? That's why it's important in this season that the teaching ministry of the Spirit of God be unleashed upon the earth. For men have known the promises, but as Paul said, to will to, to do to will is present, but how to perform, I find not. In other words, the desire is present. The knowledge of God's will is known. The willingness to do it is present, but how to perform, he said, I find not. How to perform? The method there. In Romans 7, 18, he says, for, he went on and said, for to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. And then later on, he discovered the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So I want to get a glimpse onto how, all right, we enter into this today. Now, one of the things I'll just tell you about this bread is Jesus said, all right, uh, and it was said even in the wilderness, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. So we understand that what we are feeding on is not physical bread or the equivalent of physical bread is the words that proceed out of the mouth of God. In the New Testament, we call this the rema. You feed upon that. The same thing Jesus said in John 15, 7. If you abide in me, and my words, same thing, my words abide in you. You feed on my words. He, say, he went on and said, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you by my Father who is in heaven. But I want to give a perfect example of a person that walked in this reality and walked in this truth. And we'll find Jesus in his earthly ministry pointing to today and almost indicating that men or people who don't understand this dimension then are going to miss out on the best that God has and what he has in store this season. And we'll find this in Matthew chapter 8. And I'll start reading from verse 5. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 5. And the Bible tells us when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him. A centurion is like a colonel in the Roman army that had battalion but under him. And what did he say? He said, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Now, he wasn't even believing for himself because people ask questions. Can I exercise faith for another and get results? Yes, you can. You saw that the woman exercised faith for her daughter. Her daughter was not even there, right? Jesus said that one of the uh, other, other go in one of the other gospels, Jesus said, "For this thy saying." There he said, "As you have believed." For somewhere it said, "For this thy saying." These words that came out of your lips, he said, "Your daughter has been made whole." So the daughter was not even physically present, but in the realm of the spirit, there is no distance. 
once she stepped into truth and into the supernatural, she got healing for her daughter. So the point is, you can, through the operations of the Spirit of God, all right, exercise faith and get healing for your daughter. He here got healing for his servant, someone that worked for him. Friends can get healing, all right, for a friend. How do we know this? When the friends brought him and opened up the roof, Jesus saw their faith. It was the friends who carried, all right, the man who was sick of palsy and opened up the roof. The faith Jesus saw was the faith of his friends and said, you are healed at this particular point. So there is a relational power when it comes to walking in faith. You can believe God, all right, for somebody else, okay? At best, you tell the person to shut up and don't say anything negative while you operate in the realm of the Spirit on behalf of that person. So it tells us here in, in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 5 here, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant, and a centurion means he was of Roman origin. All right, this was a Roman. You see, again, this wasn't an Israelite, it wasn't a Jew. And he said, my servant lieth home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. Well, you say, why did Jesus accept to go and heal this Roman centurion when he wasn't a Jew? Now, the Gospels were written by four different individuals. And in every scenario that plays out, you will have at least two of the writers right, reporting what actually happened in the situation. And so it's important that you read both accounts. You see, I don't want to get into this because the Gospels there shows the four faces of Jesus. Now, I'm in a building here. This building has four walls. Now, if we paint the one on the north side, we paint that wall green. We paint the one on the south side red. We paint the one on the east side blue. I will paint the one on the west side yellow. So we're going to have green, red, blue, and yellow. Now, if you are coming from the northern side, and that northern side, we've said, all right, was painted a certain color. And you say, well, and I describe to you, once you're coming on the northern side there, and I, and, and I use the color of the southern side to describe the color of the wall that you are going to see, and you are coming from the northern side, then you are going to walk past the building because I said it will be red and you saw another color, right? So it's important that there were four sides there to Jesus, which means the humanity of Jesus was seen. Jesus as one a descendant of Abraham was painted there uh, by Matthew there. He began the lineage from Abraham there. Uh, you'll find Luke talking about him as the son of Adam, the humanity of Jesus. You will find, all right, Mark talking purely. He did not start from the lineage of Jesus at all. He started from the public ministry of Jesus, Jesus as a servant, the face of the ox, one who went straight into ministry. You'll find Matthew talking about him as the king of the Jews, one who descended from Abraham, so he starts, all right, the genealogy of Jesus from that point. And then you have John that just spoke purely about the divinity of Jesus and made no reference to his humanity and said in the beginning was the word. So you have to read the four accounts. Now, if you read the other account of the Roman centurion, you'll find out that it wasn't him directly that went to Jesus. He went to the elders of the Jews there. And when the elders got to Jesus, what they said, so you have a complete picture. Read, once you're reading any story there, read every account of the story, meditate upon it and get the full picture. All right? You look 7-3. When the head of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews. So the people he actually sent were the elders of the Jews. He didn't just go. Beseeching him that he will come and heal his servant. 
And then verse 4, all right? And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was, was worthy for whom he should do this. In other words, they were telling Jesus that he is not a Jew, but he is worthy. And the, what they said was that because he loveth a nation and hath built us a synagogue. Now, what they were trying to tell Jesus was that the covenant said, I will bless them that bless you. All right. Therefore, even though he's not a Jew, by reason of him being a blessing to the nation, that also he is a blessing to the seed of Abraham, we can extend the blessing of the covenant also unto him. So that's what they said. All right. So that's what motivated Jesus on that legal ground. So you don't say, well, there's a violation of it. We said the Seraphonician widow and we've contradicted ourselves. No. All right. Read every account. Study the scriptures properly. Okay. Every single account. That's the only way you're going to get the right picture. All right. Matthew 8 and verse 6. Saying, my servant life at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Now verse 7. And Jesus said, I will come and heal him. So there was some background to that. And they centurion said Lord I am not worthy that thou should come under my roof speak the word only and my servant shall be made whole now let's go to the account in Luke and let's go back to the account in Luke quickly um, and then we'll read it also in Luke so we'll get the narrative properly now Jesus went with them so he went with the elders of the Jews okay because Matthew's account caught something short. And when he was now not far from his house, so the Jews, elders of the Jews said, we'll go with you. So as they were going, and he was now close to the house of the centurion, the centurion now sent his friends, you can see that the story now is beefed up, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shalt enter under my roof. That you should physically come in. For I am not a Jew. Wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. That's what he was saying. But say in a word, or speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Speak the word only. For I am a man set under authority. Having soldiers under me, I say to one, go, he goeth, to one come, he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. And when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned about, marveled, and turned about, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great, no, not in Israel. That in all this ministry I'm doing in Israel, I've not found this kind of faith. He said, not in the whole of Israel. Verse 10. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. In other words, Jesus didn't have to be there physically. And they went and found sick. Now verse 11 there. He tells us, and it came to pass, uh, the day after... All right, he went into a city. Now, so he stops there. But let's go to the account of Matthew. Now, let's go. So you read both together to get the complete story. He said, the Lord, and saying, the Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will call him, heal him. And the centurion answered and said, I am not worthy that thou should come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Verse 9. I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to this man, go, he goeth, come, he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doeth it. And Jesus heard it, he marveled. Now, this is what I want us to get. And said unto them that followed him, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Then hear what he said next. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and from the west, and was referring to the Gentiles, and shall sit down with Abraham. So they will sit there in that table, at that table. Abraham, there's that table, 
Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 12. And he said, but the children of the kingdom, so he was referring to the Jewish people, shall be cast into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So he was saying, this man understood something. And what he was saying was, this man said, he did not require that I be physically present in his house. Because what's going to happen is, it tells us that he said, all I need is your word spoken. The right word spoken. The Rema word spoken. And if that word is spoken, my servant, which means you are not, you are not, you are not even physically present when you said it. But you said it in the realm of the spirit there and you said it out on the earth. And the demonic forces heard that word spoken. And it says, my servant, will, and it, look, my friend, Jesus is coming to your house. Please think about this. You sent for Jesus. Jesus is on the way to his house. This must have been a remarkable deep revelation. Jesus is close to your house. It is at that point something dawns on you. And you say, Jesus, and you take a huge risk. You don't have to come to my house. Now, it wasn't Jesus that told you, you don't have to come to my, I don't have to come to your house. No, no, no. He was close to your house when you changed your mind. And he must change it based on a revelation he received from God. And Jesus was saying, this is the revelation that is going to be at the forefront of my man, the manifestation of my power when I am no longer physically present. He has stepped into it. He is saying your physical presence in my house is not required. All that is required is the appropriate word for this particular situation spoken. And if the appropriate word is spoken into, and you are the one who knows that word. And if you speak that word right into the earth, my servant shall be made whole. And Jesus was saying, when I am gone, and I'm no longer physically present, he was saying this. He was saying the people that understand the power of my spoken word to convey my spiritual presence into their situations, they are the ones who will be eating from the bread of that, from the bread of the kingdom at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, they will be faced with him. And they will understand that to feed on the bread that will transform our lives, that will heal our bodies, Jesus doesn't have to be physically present again. It is the Holy Ghost who resides on the inside of us that will teach us what we are to say. And when we say the appropriate word there, the power of God will be released by the Spirit and that power will be released into our lives and there will be a change. Why did he tell us in the book of Romans? He says, my prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. But he says, but not according to knowledge. So they didn't know something. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about. So what did they not understand this righteousness? What is that righteousness? He goes to verse 5 and describes it. It says, Moses described the righteousness which of the law, that the man that doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith that they didn't have, speaketh on this wise, say not in thy heart, who shall ascend? Which means you are still looking for the physical presence of Jesus and bring Christ down. Or who shall descend into the deep and bring him back up for Jesus to come? But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart. This is the word of faith that we preach. That if a man shall confess and believe in his heart. And he was saying, the Roman centurion stepped into that revelation. That all that is required is the spoken word. And this is the new dimension. Those who will sit at that table. What will amount to the bread of the kingdom is the appropriate word. And remember it tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. If we put up verse 8, this appropriate word is a coded word. Look at what it says from verse 6. Look, just listen to what it's saying. How be it we speak wisdom 
among them that are perfect. That word perfect means mature. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the prince of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Which means Jesus was the one that knew the words to speak. That brought about healing. The bread of the kingdom are these words. But they are not cheap common words. They are words that are given by the Spirit. It says, which God ordained before the world to our glory. Which none of the prince of this world knew had they known it, they would not have crucified Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen, ear has not heard, neither did he entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them, prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit, for the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now quickly go to verse 12. It goes on. Now we have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit who is of God, or which is of God, that we may know those things freely given to us of God. Look at what it says next. Which things we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches or gives. So the bread of that kingdom are words that the Holy Ghost gives you to speak. And when you speak the right words, not just any word, when you speak the appropriate word, the power of God will be released to bring about the fulfillment of that thing. If a person has been bound for 18 years, there is an appropriate word that you speak. Paul spoke the appropriate word. So that man who was born from his mother's womb, lame in Lystra, when he heard Paul speak, he ate of that bread. And the Bible says he had faith to be healed. And immediately, strength came to his feet. Okay? So I want us to see something. Let's quickly go back to Matthew 5 and let's look at verse 10. Now Jesus marveled. Now let's go to verse 12. It says, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness, which means they won't have this revelation, and they shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I've got to finish here quickly. Verse 13, and Jesus said, go thy way, as thou hast believed, so be it done. And a servant was healed that same hour by the appropriate word. Now, verse 14, I want you to see something. Jesus said, I have not seen this kind of faith, nor in the whole of Israel. Even his apostles, his disciples did not have this faith. Look at what happened next. And when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of fever. Jesus had to enter the house of Peter to do this. Verse 15. And he touched her and the fever left her. And she arose and ministered. Peter himself did not understand. Speak the word only. Jesus entered physically to touch. And what he was saying was, I will no longer be around to touch. So you better understand what the Roman centurion understood. And what he understood was when Jesus coming to your house, that there are words of Jesus to be spoken. And Jesus says, my spirit is now on the inside of you. He will take the things of Jesus and show them unto you so that you can say these things. And when you say these things, then the power of God will be released out of our lives. So here we conclude this message here. Five, that the message here is we have the spirit of God, that there are words that we speak that will cause the power of God to be released into our lives. Appropriate words. Correct words. Not just anything. There's the right word that releases it. The words that will stir up that power. Uh, remember Jesus said, this is the commandment I have received. What I should say and what I should speak. And the church is getting to this place. Knowing the words to speak. Knowing the words to speak. In other words, Jesus knew the words to speak to five loaves that were multiplied. He knew the words. That's what is called the mystery of the kingdom. He knew the words to speak to water that when you draw out, it becomes wine. He knew the words to speak. 
And the Holy Spirit wants to start teaching us. That's the bread of the kingdom. Teaching us the words to speak out of scripture. That when we speak these words, that's why it says we speak a wisdom. All right? Hidden wisdom, which is only known to the mature, which none of the princes of this world. In other words, as they were crucifying Jesus, he was saying some words. And because he was saying those words, the crucifixion led to resurrection. And so Jesus, by the Spirit, wants to teach us a language of power. That is the bread of the kingdom. That you can speak into the lives of your children, for we've shown that the people that got it here, got it on behalf of people, speak it and bring about real power within our lives. We've got to stop here. Uh, because of time but let me just pray for every single person on that sound of my voice father i pray for every single person that this blessing that you have placed upon the gentiles will rest upon our lives that this day we begin to experience the power of the holy spirit in opening up the eyes of our understanding that we might discover his words out of the scripture place these things on our lips and seek his power within our lives. I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice. If you have not received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and be filled with the Holy Ghost, then you cannot have access to this dimension of life to cause words to come out of your belly that will change the physical world around you. You want to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. There are words that you need to speak. And I want to pray with you. Just place your hand, right hand on your chest, and make this confession after me. Father, I declare out of my lips that you sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for my sins. And on the third day, after the redemption and the ransom was paid in full by his blood. You raised him up from the dead and placed him at your right hand. I now confess Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. I declare that I'm saved. I am a child of God. I have the Spirit of God within me. If you made this confession with me, uh, there will be something that will come upon your screen, number and some details. Reach out to us, send us an email, all right? Send a message through that. I will reach back to you and, and minister more of God's power unto you. As we bring this service to a close, if you want to give your offering unto God, um, the, on the screen right now, um, the way and manner in which you can give electronically, and there's a free will offering. If God lays anything in your heart to give, this is how it can be done. Now, purpose that particular figure in your heart at this moment, and then I want to pray for you. Father, as they have purposed freely within their heart to give unto you, you've said you love a cheerful giver. I therefore pray that you cause your grace to abound as that channel has been opened in their heart. You cause your grace to abound into their life through that channel. And you multiply the seed that they have sown. That this grace as Paul said, caused him to labor more than every other person. I pray that these ones will have work to do with their hands and they will have it in excess measure because of the thoughts, because of the ideas, because of the insight that you will give unto them. Pursuing those ideas with the work of their hands Pursuing the fulfillment of those thoughts and ideas with the work of their hands. Lord, they will have it in abundant measure in the name of Jesus. This is productive labor that will bring about the bread of the increase of the earth into their lives in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I want to say 
week at this point. Thank you for uh, watching and listening to this. And uh, we're looking forward to in the near future, by the grace of God, that we'll be able to meet physically within this building, rejoicing and praising God. But in the meantime, make use of all the channels uh, that we are ministering to people um, uh, through um, Instagram live chat, through um, our continuous on mixlr.com forward slash covenant. We have what we call meditational prayer, very powerful thing. Probably the most powerful thing I've ever done in ministry. 6.30 a.m. and 9 p.m. every day, every day, to change the shape of the consciousness of people by meditating on God's word so that you emerge out of this situation as an indestructible and incorruptible being upon the earth, carrying the power and the grace of God to be successful and fruitful in Jesus' name. We love you and God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ for your word this morning. I ask in the name of Jesus that by the power of your spirit, this word will bring forth fruit within the lives of the listeners. I prophesy over your lives today that as the blessing of Abraham rested upon Isaac, as the blessing of Abraham rested upon Jacob, and as the blessing of Abraham rested upon Joseph, that gave them remarkable insights, that made them men of rare insight and foresight, that brought soundness of mind and perfect love inside their heart. I declare that same spirit is stirred up on the inside of you. You are energized by the power of that spirit. So work in perfect love and equipped with a sound mind. You go out this week in the name of Jesus with rare insight into things and with foresight. You understand the challenge that you are facing this moment, the vision that is beyond you. You are granted by the power of the Spirit residing on the inside of you remarkable insight so surmounts that challenge and to understand how to go about that vision in the name of Jesus. It shall be said of you shortly, this man, what is it that you are doing that such power exhumes from your heart? And you shall say unto them, there's a treasure that resides on the inside of me and the excellence of the power emanates from the Holy Spirit the spirit of faith. What I believe, I say, and he performs it in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all and have a wonderful week in his presence.